And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Do you not fear me, declares the Lord? Do you not tremble before me? I place the sand as the boundary for the sea, a perpetual barrier that cannot pass. Though the waves toss, they cannot prevail. Though they roar, they cannot pass over it. But this people has a stubborn and rebellious heart. They have turned aside and gone away. They do not say in their hearts, Let us fear the Lord our God, who gives rain in this season, the autumn rain and the spring rain, and keeps for us the weeks appointed for the harvest. Your iniquities have turned these away, and your sins have kept good from you. November 1606 that the Virginia Company of London informs the men who had settled at Jamestown their priorities once they uh, were to land. The final paragraph concluded with the following. Lastly and chiefly, the way to prosper and achieve good success is to make yourselves all of one mind for the good of your country and for your own, and to serve and fear God, the giver of all goodness. For every plantation which our Heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted out. Well, my brethren, last week we saw the final statement. Every plantation which our Heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted out. It is extremely significant in terms of the foundation of this nation, and if I might say, is rooted in the Holy Scriptures. The words written to the founders at Jamestown, every plantation which our Heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted out. It's not put there, my brethren, just as some sort of closing statement. Rather, it's a culmination of the central thought presented to these travelers who would come to settle in the New World. Lastly, and of most importance, they say, to serve and fear God. Everything established, counter the ways of God, shall be removed. This was the foundation of everything they were to do in establishing this new colony here in Virginia. That's why the settlers, when they first arrived off of Cape Henry, in April 29, 1607, they planted a cross. And of course, they had worship. They came to we known as Jamestown after that. They reported that was the first church service they held were outdoors under an awning or a sail fastened to three or four trees. Taking the words to heart, my brethren, that every plantation which our Heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted out. Oh, my brethren, Jamestown was formed on the shores here of the James River in 1607. But the land itself, of course, came much earlier. See, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The scripture tells us that God separated the water from the dry land. And God placed the sand as a barrier, a separation that the water could not pass. And when we ponder, my brother, God's great masterpiece, realize God spoke it all into being. And no wonder the scripture says that God saith, in Jeremiah 5, 22, Do you not fear me, declares the Lord. Do you not tremble before me? The psalmist speaks clearly also similarly about the fear of the Lord. In Psalm 36, beginning in verse 6, he saith, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathered the waters as the sea as a heap. He put the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth 
fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the word stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he has chosen for his heritage. I really, the psalmist not only speaks of the need to fear the Lord, but he tells us what that should look like. He says, the fear of the Lord is to stand in awe of our mighty God. Now we look at some definitions of the word awe. One says an overwhelming feeling of reverence, admiration, fear, etc., produced by this grand sublime, extremely powerful, all the like. We are to fear God with reverence and awe for who he is, my brethren, overwhelming respect and wonder for the majesty and the power of our mighty God, where we are to realize that he is God and we are not. And the New Testament describes this as being poor in spirit, that before holy, righteous, and just God, I don't measure up in any way, that I fall short of the glory of God. And brother, that should bring us to our knees and, and beg and help us beg for mercy before a holy God. And in that moment, the scripture provides us hope where it says to fear the Lord in Proverbs says this, to fear the Lord is beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is insight. See, the wisdom that's spoken of here comes from God alone. It's certainly not derived from man's so-called intellect. For the scriptures say, as Paul writes, the wisdom of God, or the wisdom of this world, he says, is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wives, that they are futile. And the Proverbs writer speaks similarly about godly wisdom. Speaking of godly wisdom, the Proverbs writer says, this, whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. He who fails to find me injures himself. All who hate me love death. My brother, it's clear from the scriptures and being in tune with God through our, whole, through our senses that we've been given. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies above proclaim his handiwork. Day after day, they pour out speech. Night after night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, no other words where their voice is not heard. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the word stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. My brethren, Scriptures we saw says that blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. People whom you have chosen as his heritage. My brother, that begs the question, how can we expect to be blessed as a nation somehow claiming God be on our side without making him Jesus Christ, God in the flesh came to earth, making him Lord of our lives. And if he is Lord, we must separate ourselves from sin for every plantation your Heavenly Father has planted shall be rooted out. My brethren, simply making a one-time uh, sinner's prayer, saying that out loud is, is not the answer we're looking for here, my brethren. We must recognize we're sinners who can do nothing on our own to solve our sin problem. We must recon recognize and receive the one who has already dealt with with our sin problem, the one who forgives our sins, the one who removes our sin penalty. He paid for it with his own flesh and blood on the cross, willingly gave up his life for you and for me, my brethren. This is Jesus, and we must, we must, we must receive him by faith, my brethren. We make him Lord of our lives, and we daily commit to picking up our cross and following him each and every day. We're saved by grace through faith, not attempting to adhere 
to the full requirements of the law. No, Paul says, um, you are severed from Christ. You, would be, you who would be justified by the law have fallen away from grace. Saved by grace through faith, my brethren. That's what we need. That's who we are. That's what Jesus has done for us. But yet we must separate ourselves from sin. We separate ourselves by taking a different path in life. The Apostle Paul says in this regard, I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And further, he says, the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. Desires of the Spirit against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. See, the sinful desires of our flesh, flesh nature are opposed, my brethren, opposed to the godly living by His Spirit. There's a clear separation between walking by the Spirit of God and walking by the sinful flesh nature. My brethren, if the sand is a boundary that waters cannot pass, so by walking by the Spirit of God is a boundary that the sinful living of the flesh cannot pass. My brethren, as we observe the, the waves running back and forth, over the sand, I'm reminded how easily we can allow sin to run back and forth over our lives, providing no clear separation between walking by the Spirit of God and living in the flesh. My brethren, this cannot be so, cannot be so for the man or woman of faith. And let us be clear, brethren, we're not, we're not talking about being fully righteous. This will not take place until eternity we enter God's kingdom. That's why at the end of his life, Paul saith to the young man Timothy, at the end he says, Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And he says this for us, not only me, but also all who have loved his appearing. See, what we're talking about is making a conscious decision each day as a person, as people of faith, firmly committed to following the Lord Jesus Christ as led by the Holy Spirit, separate ourselves from the sin that so easily entangles us. Being saved by grace through faith means we've been saved from sin. We've been forgiven. The death penalty paid in full by Jesus on the cross. My brethren, this does not remove the temptation of sin. No, my brethren, we will still be tempted each and every day. We must walk by the Spirit that separates us from a life of sin. The Spirit of God and a believer is opposed to the sinful nature of the flesh that we are born into. Therefore, if we walk by the Spirit of God, we shall not gratify the desires of the flesh. My brethren, the scriptures speak so clearly about the need to separate ourselves from sin. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth and such, he says this, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? What portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? And Paul saith, do not be unequally yoked. He is not saying have nothing to do with an unbeliever. He's not saying don't associate with them. For even the Lord Jesus Christ says to his disciples, when he's praying to God the Father, when he's getting ready to leave this earth, he says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. As you sent me into this world, so I have sent them into the world. And brethren, than believers are sent into the world to engage people in the world with the love of Jesus. Thus loving your neighbor as yourself. And believers are to avoid the worldly, sinful desires. The things of this world that are contrary to the things of God. Therefore, believers are in this world 
but they must not be they may, must not be partakers of the things of the world separated apart from the world See, the believer's home my brethren is not this world so we are to live lives not as the world lives believers are not of this world they are not to live lives as people do in the world the sinful flesh nature avoiding separating ourselves from the sin the scripture says we are temple of the living God as God said I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them I will be their God and they shall be my people therefore Go out of their midst and separate from them, the Lord says. Touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. My brethren, as, the, as believers in Christ Jesus, believers believing God's promises of Jesus Christ the Messiah that God's promises are true believers we are the body of Christ he is the head God is the head Christ Jesus as American people we are a body of this nation the question being who is the head my brethren of us as a nation if we desire God's blessings upon us upon our nation, then he must be the head. I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. For every plantation which our Heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted out. Amen.